Sorry, I'm a little late. Um, I was having some technical problems. So I'm gonna go ahead and wait just a couple minutes to see if, um, give anybody time to, to hop on and do. Wait just a minute or so. I hope you guys are having a great day. The sun's finally out here, which is really nice. It has a tendency to affect my mood very significantly. Just give it another minute or so. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, before I get too deep in here, I just wanna let you know that um, I have a lot of information to share and I'm trying to keep myself on track and my time very efficient and so I may not reply to questions or comments as they pop up, but please feel free to write them in the comment section and when I'm done, I'm gonna go over and um, reply to any comments, answer any questions, um, whatever you guys have to do after the fact. I'm just gonna try to keep this short and uh, simple and as direct as possible. So, all right, I'm gonna um, start with a word. In doing and studying and learning about things like ADHD and ADD, um, you run across the word neurotypical quite a bit. And in my head and my understanding is basically it's considered normal. And so um, there's a broad word that describes so many different things, any, like from the, um, the spectrum of the autism spectrum, um, ADHD, dyslexia, I think even colorblindness, they all fall into this broad category of non-neurotypical. Um, and so in my, I don't really enjoy the word, but I'm, for ease of um, conversation, I'm gonna continue to use it maybe. In my house, there are five of us total. My husband is probably the only one that would be categorized as non-neurotypical. Um, my kids range in age from 23 is the oldest one to 11 is the youngest. And so considering the four, um, all three of them plus myself fall into this non-neurotypical category, I've had years and years and years of working um, with medical doctors, with psychiatrists, with therapists, um, uh, with one of them we even had like did some genetic testing and tons and tons of reading. So um, when I'm talking about these things, I'm talking from real experience. This is not something I've read. This is something I live with, with myself and with my kids. So one of the things that I don't like, or it doesn't really accurately describe what ADD or ADHD is, is the word deficit to begin with. When you hear the word deficit, um, it comes across or you get the feeling of that something is missing or something is not right. And so in using that word to describe how um, how these brains think and how they operate, when you focus on the deficit side, of course, it naturally leads to the belief that when someone has ADD or ADHD, that they're not able to pay attention, that there's something missing that stops that from happening. It's really not true. It's not the best way to describe it. What they, um, what you're experiencing and how you're viewing the world at that point from that, that ADD brain is that there's so much things and you are paying attention to everything. So the difficulty comes in, the problems come in is trying to figure out how to filter it. It's not that you're not paying attention, you're just paying attention to so many things at one time that you're not really sure how to filter where your focus should be and should not be. Um, on the flip side of that, there's this, uh, another side of ADD it's called hyperfocus. Like you can get so caught up in one particular topic that everything else falls by the wayside. Um, an example I usually use for that, I think it was about six or eight years ago, I watched a um, program on the History Channel about women from the Bible, right? And next thing you know, I really, I didn't even have a choice but to sit down and research and write like six or eight pages of stuff on, um, the Phoenician people, because that's where Jezebel came from. And that's just, I was so hyper-focused on it that unless I got it out of my brain and into something physical, paper, reading, whatever, I wasn't, like I couldn't focus on anything else. Um, another thing that run into is, um, well, I'll get into that later, but that's why so many people with ADD or ADHD tend to like to stay up late at night, or in my case, get up really early in the morning. It's because it's easier. That's the time that it's best to be able to do uh, detailed or more tedious tasks. When the rest of the world fades away, then you can focus on whatever is in front of you at the time rather than trying to focus on 27 things at once. One of the, the, I guess a little bit of an extreme story, but my middle son, I remember getting a phone call. He was probably fifth or sixth grade. It was before middle school. 
and his teacher called just absolutely flabbergasted. She just didn't know what to do. And what she was having an issue with is he was sitting in desk and he in his desk in the classroom and he would have his textbook open, he would have his library book on top of the textbook and turning around and trying to talk to another student. And when she was calling him out trying to um, catch his attention or make him realize, you know, that he was spaced out, he could answer the question that she was just previously talking about too. So that's why I'm talking about paying attention to all the different things at once. Of course, her frustration was how do we redirect his attention so that he's not disturbing other people because not everybody in the classroom can focus on several different things at once like he can. Um, and the second most prevalent, I guess, uh, frustration people deal with when their brains are wired towards the ADD or ADHD side of the world is it's, it's called executive function. Um, if you think about a CEO or a you know, chief executive of a business, that person's responsibility is to develop and maintain a long-term ultimate goal of where the company should be at the same time recognizing and realizing the tasks that are required to get there. Um, with an underdeveloped sense, underdeveloped executive function in the brain, it's, it's very difficult to do that. I like to use an example of um, when someone's playing baseball or softball, and the coach will sit there and say, okay, your feet need to be here and your hips and your arms and your elbows are all supposed to do this certain thing. And when you're talking to the kid that's, you know, trying to hit the ball, they absolutely understand it. It's not a matter of not understanding. They get it. If they could probably um, repeat it back to you right there within five seconds. But in that minute and a half or two minutes that it takes from the coach to walk away and the ball to actually come to the batter, not only, it's not that they can't remember the information, but when they're trying to pull it back out to make it useful to them, it um, sometimes they're pulling it out in the wrong order or they're not pulling it all out at once. And this is where you see a lot of this frustration. Um, had with the opportunity to sit for 30 minutes with no other distractions, they can probably write down each and every step exactly how they were supposed to do it. But in the moment when it needs to be utilized, they're pulling it out in all kinds of crazy ways and places. So that's where you get a lot of the frustration and anger um, with kids and adults too sometimes who are dealing with the ADHD function and the executive function side. And of course, as with anybody, your experience or your child's experience is gonna run the gamut. It's not gonna be, you know, one kid might be more easily distracted than another, the other one might be the executive function development that's causing an issue. No, no one's gonna be exactly the same. So the next thing is kind of, um, how do we go forward? How do you do this? How do you manage it? What are some natural ways and approaches? You can help your child or are yourself in learning to deal with this. Um, the biggest one, well, one of the, <laughs> something really good for you to keep in mind and a lot, get a lot of relief from parents is that you actually hold the key as a parent or as the teacher or whatever other adult caregivers in the picture, you hold the key to be able to fix it. Like it, it really, it's very simple. And so if you're feeling helpless or, um, frustrated, just know that there really is a way out. One of the things is to recognize and realize that the ADHD brain or ADD brain is not something, it's not an illness to be cured. It's not a problem to be fixed. Um, it just is. It's as neutral as whatever the weather is outside or the fact that, you know, the earth is round, but however you want to view it, it, it's something that's not going to change. It's innate. It's how it's there. It's how the brain is wired and you're not going to get around it. And so to try to go about um, helping and managing and getting your child to be more successful, when you approach it from an illness or a problem standpoint, you're only going to run into frustration. Um, I used to do this a lot when it came to punishing, right? I thought that if they didn't punish or, you know, if they didn't do their work correctly, or they couldn't pay attention or I got one more note from the teacher saying that they were distracting, they were too distracted in class. I mean, punishment's going to have to work, right? Well, there's two aspects to punishing a kid with ADHD for those particular symptoms. One is it's useless, like it's utterly useless. You're going to be wasting your time, you're wasting their time. Um, you'd be more... <laughs> You have more success trying to drain the ocean with a straw. I mean, it's it's really just, that's how their brain is wired. And so accepting the fact that their brain's wired differently than yours is the very first step um, to getting there. And then the other part of punishing when it comes to ADHD symptoms, because I promise every thought, feeling, and emotion that you have related to your child's um, school success or behavior in a classroom or anything like that, I guarantee you, your child has not only had those, but then they also get the added um, 
bonus, if you will, of the shame, of the dread, of the fear. Um, they are just, they know that they're not seeing the world and understanding the world the same way you are, the same way the teacher is. And so to punish them is just, um, you're just adding on to it because not only are they frustrated and angry too, they're feeling ashamed, they're feeling broken. I mean, one of my children even at, um, in an extreme moment was like, mom, my brain is broken. I don't even know how I'm alive. My brain just doesn't work. I shouldn't be here. It gets, the, the children have <laughs> these emotions and it, it carries with them for a long time. So punishing is really not useful. Um, the first thing you can do, and you can try it, I mean, this afternoon with, you know, when you're doing homework and things like that, is just pausing and understanding, okay, my child is not doing this to be obstinate. They're not trying to be difficult. They're not doing this on purpose. So just recognizing, okay, this is a symptom of the way their brain is wired. This is not something that they really can fix or control. And then once you do that and you can become neutral and accepting that their brain's just wired differently, that's when you get to have fun because that's when the communication comes into play. It's like, okay, so what? understand that this isn't working for you, right? Sitting at the table doing three hours of homework is not cutting it. So that's when you get to say, let's try this. What about, um, do you think it would be easier if you stood up instead of sat down to do your work? How about kneeling down in front of the coffee table? Um, depending on the age of your child, you can say, okay, let's set the timer. I want you to read for three minutes. At the end of that three minutes, let's get up and take a lap around the kitchen or let's stress or do a jumping jack or whatever it is. Um, music has been very effective in my ability to concentrate and both of um, and one of my sons at least. You would think that music would be a distraction while you're trying to do homework, but what it does is rather than sitting in a quiet room where there's 478 different things that you want to pay attention to or your brain wants to run away and chase, when you put the music on, you're actually bringing your world down, you're narrowing it down. So you've got two things, you've got the music and the work. And so your brain gets the satisfaction of wanting to chase things. And then at the same time, you're able to still focus and get the work done. So you're taking it you know, from this broad spectrum of stuff, you're narrowing the focus down so you can only do those two particular things at once. So when you start going from a perspective of there's nothing wrong with my kid, there's nothing I can do to change it, so let's see what works for that child. And the more you do it and the more consistently you do it, then you can have the conversations with your kid and so your kid can start doing it too. They'll start recognizing, oh, there's nothing wrong with me, I just need to do X or I just need to do Y in order to work with my brain, not against it. So the ultimate, um, the end result of that is that you and your child become a team figuring out the most efficient way to accomplish whatever it is rather than fighting with each other and the conflict and then the conflict with each other and then the conflict that goes on with your, your own child's brain. So that's something you can actually start almost immediately. Um, the second thing is rewarding efforts as opposed to um, results. If your child, you notice that they're working really, really hard to not, um, to do well on a test or whatever it is. And they're studying and they're doing their homework like they should and they end up with a C as opposed to an A. That's fantastic, reward the effort, encourage the effort. Look, I know you're doing well, I know you've been working really hard, this is really good, and so next time we can do this way or we can, we've can we learned something different. It's becoming part of the same team rather than trying to fight against each other. Um, the same thing even with behavior in the classroom. Hey, you know, you've gone five days, well, however, like with one of my children, you went three days today without this week without punish work. Fantastic. Let's get this punish work done. And then next week we'll try, you know, to do three days again or maybe even four days. It'll go forward. Um, again, it's putting you guys on the same side of the team and encouraging their effort because when the effort is encouraged, then they will continue to um, want to try and want to do. And then again, the more aware you are, the more effectively you learn to use the tools, then they will be too. Now, as far as herbs go, um, I do, while, if you were a client, while I'm working with you, while we get through these sticky emotional and mental hangups when it comes to ADHD, there is a formula that I use, um, an herbal formula that will help support the central nervous system to get it to function very efficiently. And so that also helps in terms of, um, well, it helps how the, the brain itself functions, and then it gives you a physical support while you're working through the mental and emotional stuff. My kids call it brain buddy juice, so it's just kind of stuck. Um, the herbs that go in there, and the ones that we use are um, ginseng. These are these little roots. And then rosemary. 
ashwagandha, ginkgo, and tulsi, which is holy basil. Those are the five main ingredients of it. Um, with any other formulations that I do, of course, they can all be customized, but those five things are the basis for supporting the stress response and your central nervous system. So the healthier brain can think, fun um, can think better and then the neurons fire more efficiently. So that's where that comes into play. Um, as far as, you know, the personalizing, some children have digestive issues because the stress and the, um, the anger and resentment build up and so they end up with um, stomach problems. So that's when we can add peppermint or if there's, um, if anxiety is an issue, then you can add chamomile and then um, it's just all you can, you can work out for adults. You can use, I like to use passion flower or lemon balm because it's, it calms down that monkey brain when you're trying to go to sleep. So that's the personalization, but the ashwagandha, rosemary, ginkgo, um, ginseng, and the tulsi are the five main ingredients of what's called the brain juice. And the way it works is I, I boil it down into a um, concentrated decoction, and then you take a teaspoon a day, or a tablespoon a day, I'm sorry, and keep it in the fridge. It's really easy. Um, and that's it. That's kind of all I wanted. I mean, I could talk on this stuff for hours, but I don't want to keep you guys are already at 16 minutes, so I don't want to keep it too late, too late or too long. Um, again, the key to all this stuff is awareness, recognizing what is the symptom of a brain wiring that can't be controlled. Expect or recognizing what it is and then working with it rather than against it. And then of course the herbal supports in the meantime can help you guys, um, adults and children, just get your brains to function a little bit more. So thank you so much for coming. Um, also um, these videos I'm doing, it's going to be for the next 10 weeks. I'm going to do one, one a week and just cover one topic. I'm trying to hit the most common things that I see with clients and customers coming in. So next Thursday at four o'clock, I'm going to be doing an um, integrated weight management. But I'm going to announce that and stuff on Facebook. So please, any questions, um, any comments, just get, I will get to them when all this is done. Thanks for listening. Have a great day.